Um, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be with you all, uh, despite in this in this unusual format. But uh, but hopefully, uh, I have. I mean, I think I have something uh, worth sharing, and so I really appreciate you all being here. Um, so what I'm doing today um, is, oh, I'm not, there we go. Uh, what I'm doing today is talking about the grammars of uh, a certain class of Austronesian languages, so so-called Philippine type languages. Um, here, all the data will come from Tagalog um, and also Tibetan. And um, these are not languages that are commonly juxtaposed together, but what I want to highlight is one striking similarity, at least on the surface, um, and then we'll see how far that goes, how deep that similarity is. And the, that parallel is that both languages, or groups of languages, um, use verbal affixes to mark the choice of relative clause pivot. So starting with Tagalog, Tagalog is a predicate initial or a verb initial language. We have post-nominal relative clauses. That's at least that's the, the canonical form. So for example, in 1A, we have child who bought cloth. In 1B, we have cloth that the child bought. And we get these two different forms of the verb buy, bumili and binili. That, and really, when you look at the word order, that is the only cue that in 1A, we have an agent relative, and in 1B, we have a theme relative. Otherwise, really, the other morphology case marking is not telling you specifically what is being extracted. On the other hand, in Tibetan, right, this is a head final, strongly verb final language with pre-nominal relative clauses, right? You're looking at Tagalog in the mirror. Now, again, you have verbal morphology telling you which argument you're relativizing over. So for an agent relative in 2A, teptiken mi, right? You have this verb t, and then uh, you have the suffix ken. That's the person who wrote books or writes books. And then in 2B, pime uh, tipete, so uh, books that Pema wrote. Uh, again, you get a different form of the verb dipa uh, versus tiken. Now, if we look at these paradigms of uh, this morphology generally, we know that each of these languages are independently known in their respective literatures for having a very rich inventory of affixes like this. So for example, looking specifically it, at the perfective uh, aspect set um, in Tagalog, we have different morphology telling us whether we are relativizing an agent, a locative or goal, uh, instrument or beneficiary, or a theme. Uh, in Tibetan, looking again at the perfective aspect, because this will matter, uh, we have a particular marker for relativizing over agents, over locative or goals, over instruments, and over themes. Right? So we have this interestingly parallel, again, at least superficially parallel, four-way alternation, these inventories in Tagalog, again, and other Philippine-type languages, and Tibetan. However, this type of parallel hasn't really been investigated together before um, because they've been described in very different terms in their respective literatures. So for Philippine-type languages, this is described as part of these languages' voice systems. I'll be introducing this in a moment. Um, and for Tibetan and other Tibeto-Burman languages as types of nominalizations. And I'll, be also, I'll also be introducing that as well. So today, um, what I'll try to convince you of is that these patterns continue to exhibit striking parallels when we go further into the behavior of relativization, in particular, when we look at the behavior of long distance relativization in Tagalog versus in Tibetan. And this long distance relativization in Tibetan has not previously been described in Tibetan. So that's based on my own original field work. Um, in particular, this data is going to challenge the analysis of Tibetan relativization as built exclusively on argument nominalizations. Um, and I'll try to, you know, try to show you at the end that there's a way to productively understand the similarities between this verbal morphology in Philippine type languages and in Tibetan, um, and also how they vary in a productive and sort of familiar way. So that's where we're going. 
We're going to start with the Philippine type languages. I want to give you uh, some background on what this alternation looks like and sort of how to think about that alternation in that type of languages. Then in section three, um, for the bulk of today, we're going to be talking about Tibetan, again, based on my own original uh, empirical work as well. And then we're going to bring these two things together at the end. Okay. So uh, let's start with the Philippine type languages. So the morphological alternation that I showed you at the very beginning with a agent versus theme relative is actually part of a much more general alternation between different clause types in Tagalog. So for example, uh, in 4A, this is a way of saying the child bought cloth at the market for mother. We get that form bumili uh, for buy. And then we notice that there's one argument here, the agent um, gets a particular case form, right? Gets this article ang, bumili ang bata. Now, there's also a different form of the verb. This is traditionally called patient voice, where it's the theme argument that gets that ang marker, um, that ang case, we could say. Um, and then we get a different verb form, and that's the binili form that we saw previously for a theme relative. We also have additional voices in these languages. So for example, so-called locative voice, the place where the buying happened could be the special unmarked, uncase marked argument. Or we have a benefactive or instrumental voice, a fourth voice, which will take, in this case, a beneficiary argument and make that the unmarked argument. Right? So every clause has one unmarked argument. The choice of unmarked argument is going to be cross-referenced by the form of the verb. So it turns out every verb has one of these voice markers, these different voice markers. It's not just something that's limited to relative clauses. And the correlation that we saw at the beginning comes from the fact that the choice of voice marker correlates with the choice of unmarked argument. Descriptively here, I'm gonna be calling this the subject, uh, but we can, we can talk about other approaches and other terms later. Um, we can think of this ang marker as a case marker, as I mentioned, as nominative case. Although a lot of this uh, literature, the way that these systems have been described, uh, ha there's some significant variation there. And now the link between the voice morphology and the form of relative clauses that we saw at the be beginning can be described as saying that these languages have a subject only extraction restriction, not just for relativization, but for a bar extraction more generally, you can only extract the subject argument. And that's why if you want to do an agent relative, well, you had better start with an actor voice clause where the agent is unmarked, that's gonna be a particular verb form like bumili for by, and then you can relativize the agent, if you want to do a theme relative, well, you should have started with a patient voice verb. You get a binili verb. The patient is going to be marked ang if it's there, but that's the argument you can then extract. That's the subject, so-called. Right. Now, I need to tell you a little bit more about long distance relatives in Tagalog as well to set up the comparison to Tibetan. So we first note that clause embedding verbs like say, sabi here, uh, also participate in this voice alternation. So here we have the embedded clause that the flower is delicious. Again, it's a predicate initial language. Um, so the water buffalo said that the flower is delicious. Here we have the verb nag sabi, and then we have ang kalabao. So the water buffalo, the agent, is the unmarked argument upstairs. So that's an actor voice form of the verb. There's also a patient voice form of the verb, so sinabi, and now the water buffalo gets a different case. That's the case that's expected on non-subject agents, so that's, that's gloss as genitive. But here, it looks like there's nothing that's actually unmarked. There's no you know, formally subject marked argument in the, cl the higher clause. Um, so we can think of what's going on in 5b as saying that it's actually that embedded clause that is getting subject status, 
right? Even though because it's a clause, it just ha always has this complementizer, it doesn't actually show a case alternation. It doesn't then get unnominative case added to it or anything like that. But we can still think of it formally as the subject. And this is going to be important for the behavior of long distance relativization. So let's take a look at that. So how do you do something like in Tagalog, the water buffalo that the teacher said that the woman that the man would give a flower to, right? So let's build this up. We're gonna have a head noun water buffalo. We have the higher clause. And then the embedded clause has to be in locative voice. Why? It has to be in locative voice because in order to extract the embedded argument, it's an embedded beneficiary argument. And therefore, we need to extract a beneficiary from the embedded clause. We need to first make that the subject of the embedded clause. You do that using the locative voice in this case. But what happens to the higher verb, to the say verb? Well, here it turns out the correct form is to use sinabi nanguru. So sinabi, as we saw, is the patient voice form of the verb. And the way to think of this is that, uh, for example, an actor voice here is going to be bad. We can't alternate this and change this into actor voice where guru, the teacher, is now the subject of the higher clause. We need to be extracting so that across a higher verb that specifies the embedded clause as its subject, as its so-called subject, even though we don't see nominative case in this case. And that's the only grammatical way to do this long distance relativization. So to reiterate here, the relative clause pivot must be the subject of the embedded clause. That part is not terribly surprising. But in addition, in long distance relatives, the embedded clause itself must be the so-called subject of the higher embedding verb as determined by the choice of voice morphology. Right? So everything looks like subject extraction or sub-extraction from subjects, if we think of these as, you know, subjects, right? That's the system, okay. All right, so to summarize again, the behavior of these Philippine type languages, again, this is sort of setting the scene, this is some background. Um, relative clauses in Philippine type languages reflect the choice of extracted pivot because of their rich inventory of so-called voices, including options for some oblique arguments to be the so-called subject, together with a so-called subject only restriction on relativization, as well as other A-bar extractions. And again, what that means is that in long distance relativization, the embedded clauses required to be the higher verbs subject. So in other words, the subject only restriction holds for each verb in a complex chain of relativization. Each movement step has to be movement of the subject or movement out of the subject. Okay. All right, that's the background. Now for something completely different. Let's go to Tibet, okay? And again, I'm gonna start with some background here uh, before we dive into the new data. So uh, again, Tibetan is a strongly head final, uh, verb final language. Verbs in Tibetan end with a series of auxiliaries, which I'll just be glossing together as aux here, uh, which encode tense aspect and famously evidential values as well. So for example, in seven, we have an SOV sentence, Tashi ki tep digidu. Tashi is writing a book. Um, now, suppose that we want to relativize over its agent, right? So what do we get? Then we get example eight, tep tikenmi. Now, notice that we keep the verb stem, right? But then, in relativization, you have to take off all of those aspectual tense evidential auxiliaries. You drop the auxiliaries, and you get this extra suffix. You get this different suffix that replaces all the auxiliaries. And uh, here, it happens to be ken. Um, but these endings have traditionally been called in the Tibetan literature nominalizer endings. And we'll see why. Notice also in the translation of eight that eight means a person who wrote books or write books or is writing books. And so because we've stripped off the tense aspect uh, auxiliaries, uh, this sentence in eight becomes temporarily underspecified. 
So why do we think of these as nominalizations? Um, this is a much more widespread phenomenon. In the Tibeto-Burman uh, literature, relativization has often been studied under the umbrella of nominalization, which is a, a much more general, much larger topic in Tibeto-Burman linguistics. So for example, here's an example of a nominalization in Tibetan. So, so knowing Tibetan is what this verb form shepa is. We're going to see this pa a lot. We've already seen one, but we're going to see a lot more pa today. But that's an example of a uh, event or, or sort of state nominalization, knowing Tibetan. Right? Um, what's the connection between nominalization and relativization? Well, it's been claimed um, that you can think of relative clauses simply as another use of a nominalization, a so-called uh, argument nominalization. So it's true that that pa ending that we just saw, the pa nominalization we just saw for a event nominalization can also be used for an argument nominalization, in particular as a theme nominalization. So ten is peme su pate. So it's what pema made, right? Roughly, that's a we can use a free relative translation. And then now look at what I would describe as an object relative. So pemesu pe momote. Um, here we can we actually see that what that structure that we could describe as a theme nominalization in there. It looks like a some kind of theme nominalization with a genitive linker with a head noun and then again the uh, demonstrative element at the end. Um, so much more generally, uh, Noonan has said that in ad nominal modification in Bodic, that's the Tibetan language family, um, they are probably best viewed as NPs juxtaposed to the NPs they are modifying, the two NPs constituting therefore a sort of appositional structure. So uh, what's meant here, right, is that relativization in these languages is some kind of nominal modifying another nominal. In particular, in these cases, it's some kind of argument nominalization modifying a nominal head. Right? So uh, again, schematically, that is in 12. Right? I'm going to note um, in Tibetan uh, that that genitive marker between the modifying nominalization and the head noun um, is strongly preferred for all pre-nominal relatives, um, except for the subject relative with ken, although there seems to be some speaker variation there. Um, the genitive linker morphology there um, is not going to be uh, important for us, so uh, you don't need to keep track of when it occurs or doesn't in the data. Um, but this idea I want to uh, linger on for a moment, right? So semantically, if this is what relative clauses are, um, we could easily cash out this intuition um, by describing these modifiers as intersective modifiers, right? So you have an argument nominalization like what Pema made and a head noun, Momo, uh, those are dumplings. Um, and so the whole NP is going to be uh, the things that are dumplings that also are in the set of things that Pema made, right? Um, and that gets you the sort of expected restrictive relative semantics, right? So far, so good. Now let's talk about the actual uh, inventory of nominalizers. So we saw a version of this uh, table at the very beginning. There's this four-way distinction in Tibetan. So there's ken used for the extraction of agents and also a sort of broader set of subjects, including non-agentive subjects. Um, sa for the extraction of locatives and goals. Ya for relativization of instruments and imperfective themes. And pa left for perfective themes. Um, that last bit is an interaction with aspect for theme relativization, which I, I didn't mention on the first slide because this is a slight uh, twist. Um, we're gonna see this interaction at play sort of towards the end of the talk, um, but just sort of keep that in mind as well. So let's look at some examples. We've already seen a subject relative. Uh, I think we've seen, we've seen an object relative, yes. 
Uh, here's a locative relative, right? So, peme momo so se satate uh, is the place that pema made or makes momos. Again, temporarily unspecified because sa replaces the auxiliaries on the verb. We get the genitive marker, sa and e together uh, get this ablaut, it becomes se. Um, pretty straightforward. Here's an instrumental relative. We get ya morphology instead. So, peme momo su ye mokzang de. Um, and uh, here, ya is the marker that you get when you relativize over essentially a instrumental gap. So, there's a particular case used for instrumentals. And if you're extracting over one of those arguments, uh, that's what you get. You get ya or over imperfective themes, as we also mentioned a moment ago. I want to mention to really to acknowledge previous literature, but also to sort of set up where we're going, um, that of these four markers in Tibetan, there's already reason to think pa is very different from the others. So I'm going to give you three reasons. One is that classical Tibetan only used pa for all relativization. Um, and cognates of pa, therefore, are found across the Tibeto-Burman family. Those non-pa specialized relativizers or nominalizer endings um, ended as, uh, originated mostly as derivational affixes. So for example, uh, Delancey notes that in classical Tibetan, ken had only one use as a derivational suffix for trades. So xing is wood, so xingken is a carpenter, for example. It was not used productively for relativization or nominalization. Uh, the locative nominalizer sa clearly is related to the root uh, sa meaning a place. Um, so they have different origins. A second reason is that uh, even synchronically, pa is unstressed and subject to dramatic phonological reduction. The other three show compound phonology uh, maintaining a tone. Um, and that's uh, as described by Delancey. So phonologically, it behaves differently. And finally, for verbs that have distinct perfective and imperfective stems, uh, pa takes the perfective stem, while others take the imperfective stem. So the verb make that I've been using so far, for example, uh, with the uh, perfective stem, that's su, um, and so uh, you get su pe, su pa. Um, but then for other endings like uh, ken, you get the imperfective stem so, so you get so kin, so sa, so ya. So now we're moving on to the main event, right? And hopefully we're doing fine and we don't have questions. Um, but um, again, I'm happy to take questions if anything is unclear. Um, so now I wanna share um, what we learn when we look at long distance relatives in Tibetan. And to my knowledge, um, there's no previous work that's described long distance relatives in Tibetan, nor to my knowledge uh, in, um, in any other related Bodic language. Um, all the data here comes from my field work conducted in uh, Dharamsala, India, uh, which is where uh, a lot, very large, uh, the, lar the largest uh, Tibetan diaspora community lives. It's where uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama lives. Um, so uh, I've worked there with uh, the speakers in the Tibetan community. Um, in the last two summers, and this reflects the judgments of nine speakers there, and I'd be happy to talk more about uh, experiences collecting this or how I've done that. So again, parallel to our discussion of Tagalog, we're going to start by just taking a look at uh, embedded finite clause. Here, right, this is an SOV type of language. We're going to get a center embedding. So we're gonna get, for Tashi said that Pema made dumplings, I've bracketed the embedded clause, you get Tashi ki peme momo su son lapson. Now, what I'm gonna try to do first, just to demonstrate this, is show you what happens if we try to relativize over that embedded theme, right? The momo dumpling position. Here's what you get, right? You get, Tashiki peme su song lape momotezo. 
those momo that Tashi said that Pema made. Now, what's going on? What do we notice immediately? What we notice is that we get this pa marker associated with theme relatives or, or object relatives only on the higher verb of the relative clause. The embedded clause with the gap itself is just a regular finite clause with the ending song, in this case, uh, a perfective auxiliary, right? That's a full finite verb form, ce song. Um, we could try to change this, right? So if we try to change the embedded position to also be a pa, that's ungrammatical. We change the higher one to be song instead, that's ungrammatical. We can try lots of other combinations. The only one that's good is a full finite verb in the embedded position, pa on the higher verb. And we get the center embedding. We'll see another word order that avoids the center embedding uh, a little bit later. Now let's look at a long distance subject relative. The person that Tashi said made momos. Now we get this form in 19 and see what happens. We get two of these relativization or nominalization markers, right? We have ken, the subject relative marker, on the embedded verb make and we get the pa marker which was the theme or object relative marker the object nominalization marker we get that on the higher verb say right? um, so in long distance subject relatives we get this dual morphology right we get some subject subject relative morphology and some object relative morphology simultaneously and again it has to be like this. So if we try to change the embedded verb to be just a finite auxiliary, for example, that's bad. Um, if you try to change the higher one to host the subject relative marker instead, that's bad. You can try lots of other combinations. That's not gonna work, right? What you need is subject nominalization or relativization morphology on the embedded clause whose subject is moving and the higher one is gonna be the pa. Long distance locative and instrumental relative is gonna be exactly the same, right? Just set that up, uh, uh, give that to you directly. This is the place that Tashi said Pema made, Momo or makes Momo, Pa on the outside, Sa, locative nominalizer on the inside. Instrument relative is the same, Pa on the outside, Ya, the instrument nominalizer on the inside. Same pattern as the subject relatives, different than the uh, object relative. Same as the subject relatives, different than the object relative. So what we see is uh, pa fundamentally differs in its syntactic function from the other so-called nominalizers, right? So from the data that we just saw, it seems that pa marks the edge of the entire relative clause, period, right? Whereas the other markers do something different. The other markers say, I'm a clause that has a particular kind of gap. I have a marked local gap. Maybe it's a subject, maybe it's a location, maybe it's an instrument, but I have a local gap of that kind versus pa, which just says, I'm the edge of the relative clause. And under that hypothesis, we're going to have to sort of tweak this a little bit. We're going to have to say that um, pa and the marked relativizers can never co-occur, uh, so that's true. Um, you never get a verb form like uh, so, sa, pa, or su, pa, sa, uh, whatever you, you might predict or try, um, as I have. Um, and so under this theory, we could say, okay, well then that's just something about the sort of uh, morphosyntactic template of the what the verb form looks like. Maybe these morph morphemes compete for this position. Um, so if you have a marked extraction marker that you're supposed to use, you use that. Otherwise, you use pa if you're at the edge of the relative clause. That's our first set of long distance relative data. Hopefully that uh, is digestible. Okay. Gonna show you something different now. There's another word order. As I mentioned, uh, that first word order that we got uh, involves a center embedding, 
Um, and so it's actually, um, it, they're perfectly acceptable. Again, this has been tested with many, many speakers and those patterns are robust. But uh, in sort of first translations, uh, speakers will give you something else. They're gonna give you the following word order, probably. Again, this is a subject relative. This is the person that Tashi said made Momo. It's Tashi Kilape Momo Soken Mite. Um, so if we sort of follow this, right, and try to you know figure out what the constituency of this thing is, it's a little uh, it's a little interesting, right? I'm gonna um, try to give you a hint by giving you some arrows. Um, this word order seems to involve an apparently optional movement of the embedded clause towards the head now, right? I mean, linearly right word, right? How it got there, we can, we can worry about later, um, but, but linearly descriptively right word. Um, so we have the whole higher clause, Tashi said first, with pa morphology, which is which is expected, and then we have the embedded clause momo soken, uh, which is uh, momo make with subject relative morphology. That's the entire embedded clause that shows up next, and then you get the head noun me. Okay, that's an embedded subject relative. So there's an extra position kind of rightward movement alternative word order, but the morphology we're getting is exactly as we predict. Now let's look at a long distance object relative. Uh, oh, no, before then, let me make a point. Um, so uh, the semantics of this type of example, this is an aside, um, forms an argument against each of those verb with a nominalizer ending things being a pre-built argument nominalization, which then intersectively modifies the noun phrase, right? This was Noonan and Delancey and uh, really comes from Matasoff's work. This is a long running hypothesis for relativization in Tibeto-Burman languages being an argument nominalization modifying a noun. I'm, I'm in giving it the semantics, I'm assuming, uh, you know, intersectively. If that's the case, then this example that we just saw in 22 really looks like you have this higher clause, right? Which looks like the argument nominalization, what Tashi said, genitive linker, the thing that, uh, the, excuse me, the person that made Momo's genitive linker person. But as we know, the meaning of the person that Tashi said made Momo's is not intersectively a thing that is a person and that made momos and that Tashi said. That's not what this kind of long distance relative means, right? So just as an aside here, this type of data forms an argument against the view that all of these, what on the surface might look like an individual argument nominalization, that they're always pre-built in that form and then modifying nouns and that's what relativization is. That's not at least in the general case, that cannot be what relativization is in this language. Okay. Now, as promised, we're gonna go to the long distance object relative. This again is uh, a version of those momo that Tashi said that Pema made. We've seen a version of that before. This is the new word order variant of it. Tashi ki la pe, peme su pe momo tezo. Now notice, interestingly, this is a long distance object relative, but here both clauses get pa marking. We get pa on the higher verb, which comes first, pa on the lower verb, which comes next. Both of them get pa. And this is in contrast to the other center embedding board order for the long distance object relative, where remember the embedded clause just had a full finite auxiliary, and only the outermost verb, that was also la pa, so say, um, gets this pa marker. Here we get pa on both positions. So it can't be 
as I described it before, that pa marks the highest edge of the entire relative clause, period. That pa just says, I am the edge of a relative clause. That's not what's going on. Um, instead, I, I sort of suggest that the contrast between these examples with and without that sort of extra position, extra movement, teaches us that each pa, each pa morpheme corresponds to its own step of movement. It's saying something moved to this edge. In one case, in the example we just saw in 23, in one case, it is the embedded clause pied piping the embedded head, and then the pivot moves out of that. That's, that's one way of thinking about it. I think there are theoretically various ways of thinking about this, right? But this is sort of one account for accounting for the correlation between that word order difference um, and the pa morphology that shows up. Um, I want to note too that this embedded clause being on the right um, is not a generally available strategy. So, um, so if you just try to say, Tashi said that Pema made dumplings, um, my speakers basically completely reject uh, this description, Tashiki lapsong Pema momosu son. Um, they describe it as, um, as just two sentences, right? Um, as two sentences, Tashi said, but it's not clear what was said, right? Unless it refers to something else prior, right? So, um, so this type of descriptively extra position um, is not productive. Generally, the placement of the embedded clause in between the higher clause and the head noun that we saw in these examples um, has to be something specifically made available in the process of long distance relativization. So now um, I'm going to revisit the nature of pa one last time. Right? So um, we've concluded so far that ken, sa, ya indicate that I have a marked local gap of a particular kind, a subject, location, or instrument. Um, and then pa is this extra marker, uh, this other marker, sort of default sort of marker that says, uh, I have had uh, some other kind of extraction, and maybe it was the final position of an extraction, something like that, something that makes the, the other word order count as a separate movement, right? Something like that. Um, however, it is not simply the case that the higher verb of a long distance relative always gets pa, because you can also get long distance relatives where the higher verb is ya marked instead, as in 25. So this is a long distance agent relative with a higher ya. This is the person that Tashi thinks made dumplings. Tashiki sam ye momosoke mite. What's different is we get that high, the higher verb think instead of getting pa gets ya. So uh, the question is why that is. So the previous examples have all been with the verb uh, lapsong, with, with the verb lap, which is to say, right? So these are descriptions about the person that someone said did something. Uh, here, this is the verb think with the root sum. And here, at least uh, uh, the, the more natural sort of uh, setup is to use that thinking with uh, imperfective description, right? That is an ongoing event. The thinking is an uh, ongoing state. So, ya here appears because the higher verb think is imperfective in this case. And why does that matter? I'm going to take you all the way back to an earlier point about the inventory of nominalizers in Tibetan. Um, theme relatives often show up with pa, but that's in perfective descriptions. If you are doing a theme relative from an imperfective description, you use ya. Right? So what this data point that we just saw teaches us is that the choice of the pa-ya alternation on the higher verb say versus think behaves as if what we've done in long distance relative is uh, to relativize out of, to relativize it's just as if we relativized the theme of the higher verb, say or think, 
right? Even though we're not relativizing it per se, we're relativizing out of it. We're actually doing sub-extraction from the embedded clause, right? But the morphology is responding as if you have done an extraction from this particular local argument, and it's sensitive to that, right? So again, the relativizing morphology responds locally at each verb for the type of extraction that is happening locally in that clause for each step of the movement. All right, that's the New Tibetan, that's the data. Um, so now I wanna uh, present a, a way to think about this space and a way to connect the Philippine type languages and the Tagalog and the Tibetan. What have we seen? We've seen today that both Philippine type languages and Tibetan utilize verbal morphology to distinguish relative clauses with different types of pivots, as is well known in these languages, right? Um, but at first glance, this parallel seems potentially superficial um, and in particular due to two very different mechanisms, right? Remember that in Philippine type languages like Tagalog, um, these voice morph mark, these voice markers, these affixes, um, are not special relativization or nominalization morphology. It shows up on every verb. Every verb has to have one of these things. The reason why it seems to correlate with the choice of pivot in relativization is that the language has a subject-only restriction on a bar extraction. Right? Tibetan is very different. Tibetan, if you just look at relative clauses, again you get this kind of nice alternation, which looks like Tagalog, but when you look at normal finite clauses, you don't get that morphology there at all. You just have different full finite auxiliaries, which encode tense aspect and evidential values. It's only in relativization or nominalization where you drop those auxiliaries and instead you get these specialized markers that say which argument was extracted, right? So, it does really look like a somewhat superficial parallel. Um, however, as we did today, if we look at the behavior of long distance relativization in Philippine type languages and in Tibetan, um, these systems actually look strikingly similar, right? So in long distance relativization, each verb along the path reflects the thematic role of the local gap, the local pivot gap, or the thematic role of the embedded clause from which you have extracted the pivot, right? That's a description that applies equally to Philippine type languages and also to Tibetan, at least if we look at the types of Tibetan long distance relatives with the displaced embedded clauses, right? So there's a slight quirk in the morphology for Tibetan, but otherwise this description here actually holds quite strongly um, for these otherwise potentially very different systems, right? And that's something we want to understand. We want to understand the nature of this. Um, I'm gonna suggest that if we think about these Austronesian voice system languages, these Philippine tape languages in a, in a sort of different way or in a particular way, then um, we can actually make significant progress towards productively unifying and understanding the relationship between the Philippine type languages and Tibetan. So bear with me, right? We have a bit more Austronesian to get through. Um, but this is a theoretical idea. So um, these so-called voice systems in Philippine type languages that we've seen um, are often described as argument structure alternations. And I sort of used that language earlier, right? So these are often described as voices, um, although I keep putting them in scare quotes, um, and the choice of voice determines which argument is the subject, right? With nominative, um, I can keep putting things in scare quotes, but, but still, that is a very common set of terminology. It's a very common way of thinking about this world, right? And together with that, the extraction facts 
go with the claim that the only the subject can be relativized in these languages, or in the long distance case, um, you can only sub extract from subjects as well. However, that's not the only way of thinking about these Philippine type languages and their clause structure and morphology. Uh, so another sort of uh, significant body of work has proposed the following. It comes with two ingredients. One is ingredient A, that Philippine type voice morphemes, the, the alternations on the verbs, those are responses to extraction, let's say A bar extraction, such as relativization of a particular type of argument. It is extraction marking morphology on the verbs. But then, why does it show up on every verb? Well, ingredient B, every clause is required to choose one nominal to participate in extraction, always, right? Or an equivalent process that feeds that morphology, right? Every clause is required to choose one argument to treat in a special way, to move or covertly move, um, and that is going, that choice is going to feed the morphology on the verb. This is an extraction, uh, extraction marking, uh, sort of extraction response type of approach to that voice morphology in Tagalog, uh, in Philippine type languages. Very different approach, not an argument structure alternation. We can relate that B requirement that every clause is required to do one of these extractions to something very familiar, which is the pre-field requirement in Germanic V2, right? So there are other languages that you may be familiar with where in every clause you are required to do some A-bar extraction, right? So for example, in Swedish say, right? So we have a pre-field position, you can put the subject there um, and then you get something like he knows actually Ingrid, that word order, but in particular information structural uh, contexts, you could move the object there as well, or you could even move adverbs there or something else there as well. You have to fill this position, and we know that this is some kind of A-bar operation. Um, so this B requirement, this ingredient that every clause is required to choose something for A-bar extraction or a, or a similar kind of operation, uh, this might manifest itself in different ways. So for example, in Germanic V2 or in other swarms of V2, right? So you choose one argument in every clause or you know, matrix clause. Um, uh, by default, if you don't know which thing you should move, it's just something like a topic. And in Germanic V2, you move to clause initial position. That is the reflex of choosing one argument to be special because you're required to. In Philippine type languages, you have to choose one argument in every clause to treat in an exceptional way. Um, and by default, that's just going to be something like a topic. Um, and it doesn't uh, obviously overtly move in a language like Tagalog. Its word order doesn't seem restricted, but um, it does receive a particular marker, right, uh, because of that relationship. And that is the thing we described as ang. Um, um, there's also, uh, there are also languages like uh, Dinka is a Nilotic language of South Sudan um, that I've studied in, uh, in collaboration with my uh, co-authors, uh, Kopa Van Erk and Ted Levin, um, based on Kopa Van Erk's work, um, that in every clause you have to choose one argument to treat specially. Um, and the reflex of that is simultaneously moving to clause initial position and receiving a particular case form, right? Dinka seems to be a V2 Austronesian language, basically, right? That's, that's roughly the intuition, right? So again, this idea, every clause is required to do one of these A-bar extractions or a similar type of process. You have to choose one argument to treat in a special way. That's a familiar requirement. That's the B ingredient. But at the same time, real clear A-bar extraction, such as relativization or WH movement, also proceeds through this special position or process that the B 
requirement uses as well. For example, again, staying with Swedish for a moment, in relativization, it's not possible to simultaneously do relativization and also move some other argument to this V2 pre-field position. You can't do a topicalization inside and also do relativization. And the classic way of thinking of this is because those two operations compete, right? The pre-field movement, which might in the general simple case look like a topicalization, is also the position that you move through in order to do relativization or WH movement in this kind of Germanic V2, for example, as well as in Dinka. In Philippine type Austronesian languages, again, assuming that the assignment of ang and abar extraction underlyingly involve the same process, both overt abar extraction and the choice of what you gave this ang marker to will both feed the same process. They are the same underlying process and they both feed A being extraction marking morphology on the verb. So both when you do a clear overt A bar extraction and when you don't as well, there is some argument that is privileged and its choice is going to be reflected on the verb. That's a way of getting the Philippine type languages without describing it as an argument structure alternation. And I'd be happy to talk about that uh, more if, uh, if anything was unclear. The proposal for the unification is the following, that Tibetan relativization suffixes are responses to extraction in exactly the same way that Philippine type so-called voice morphemes are, right? It is extraction marking morphology of ingredient A from how Philippine type languages work. But Tibetan doesn't have ingredient B. There's no requirement for some argument to participate in this process in every clause. That's why when you just have a regular finite clause, you don't get any of these morphemes. Instead, you get these auxiliaries, right? So these verb forms in Tibetan therefore only appear in relativization. And I'm gonna flip this. I propose nominalization of uh, argument nominalization, actually I think are headless relatives, right? But in nominalization and in relativization, you get this specialized extraction marking morphology on the verb. And there's this quirk again, right? With pa or ya. It will depend on whether it is a final step of movement or not in the long distance cases. And this response mechanism in A applies per clause. For every verb you're looking, did I do a marked extraction or am I extracting out of a theme or something else, right? You do that per clause and that is exactly what we saw both in Tibetan and in these Philippine type languages such as Tagalog as well. That's it. So thank you very much. Um, I uh, look forward to any questions or comments you have.